Hello children, Miss Harris here again, ready to read chapter two of The Indian in the Cupboard. I hope you enjoyed the first chapter and I'm looking forward to finding out what happens next. Chapter two, the door is shut. Omri got dressed in a state of such high excitement that he could scarcely control his fumbling fingers enough to do up buttons and tie his shoelaces. He thought he was excited yesterday on his birthday, but it was nothing compared to how he felt now. He was dying to open the cupboard door and have another look, but the landing outside his bedroom door was like a railway station at this hour of the morning, parents and brothers passing continually, and if he were to close his door for a moment's privacy, somebody would be sure to burst in. He'd nip up after breakfast and have a quick look when he was supposed to be cleaning his teeth. However, it didn't work out. There was a stupid row at the breakfast table because Adil took the last of the Rice Krispies and although there was plenty of cornflakes, not to mention Weetabix, the other two fairly set upon Adil and made such an awful fuss that their mother lost her temper and the end of it was nobody got to clean their teeth at all. They were all bundled out of the house at the last minute. Omri even forgot to take his swimming things, although it was Thursday the day his class went to the pool. He was an excellent swimmer and he was so annoyed when he remembered, halfway to school, too late to go back, that he turned on a deal and shouted, you made me forget my swimming stuff, and bashed him. That naturally led to them all being late for school and furthermore arriving in a very grubby condition. All this actually pushed the Indian right out of Omri's mind, but the minute he set eyes on Patrick, he remembered and not for one single second for the rest of the day was that Indian out of Omri's thoughts. You may imagine the temptation to tell Patrick what had happened. Several times Omri very nearly did tell him, and he couldn't help dropping a number of tantalising hints. Your present was the best thing I got! Patrick looked rather astonished. I thought you got a skateboard. Yes, but I like yours better. Better than a skateboard? Are you having me on? Yours turned out to be more exciting. Patrick just stared at him. Are you being sarcastic? No. Later, after they'd had their spelling test and Omri had been marked three right out of ten, Patrick joked, I bet the plastic Indian could have done better. And wearingly, Omri replied, Oh, I don't think he can write English. He can just only speak. <gasps> He stopped himself quickly, but Patrick was giving him a very odd look. What? Nothing. No, what did you say about him speaking? Omri wrestled with himself. He wanted to keep his secret. In any case, Patrick wouldn't believe him. Yet the need to talk about it was very strong. He can speak, he said slowly at last. Bid, said Patrick, which was their school slang for, I don't believe you. Instead of insisting, Omri said nothing more, and that led Patrick to ask, Why did you say that about him speaking? He does! Itchy beard! Which of course means the same, only more so. Omri refused to get involved in an argument. He was somehow scared that if he talked about the Indian, something bad would happen. In fact, as the day went on and he longed more and more to get home, he began to feel certain that the whole incredible happening, well... Not that it hadn't happened, but that something would go wrong. All his thoughts, all his dreams were centred on the miraculous, endless possibilities opened up by a real, live, miniature Indian of his very own. It would be too terrible if the whole thing turned out to be some sort of mistake. After school, Patrick wanted him to stay in the school grounds and skateboard. For weeks, Omri had longed to do this, but had never had his own skateboard till now. So it was quite beyond Patrick's understanding when Omri said, I can't, I have to go home. Anyway, I didn't bring it. Why not? Are you crazy? Why do you have to get home anyway? I want to play with the Indian. Patrick's eyes narrowed in disbelief. Can I come? Omri hesitated. But no, it wouldn't do. He must get to know the Indian himself before he thought of introducing him to anyone else, even Patrick. Besides, the most awful thought had come to him during the last lesson, which had made it almost impossible for him to sit still. If the Indian was real, and not just, well, moving plastic, as Pinocchio had been moving wood, then he would need food and other things. 
and Omri had left him shut up in the dark all day with nothing. Perhaps, what if there were not enough air for him in that cupboard? The door fitted very tight. How much air would such a very small creature need? What if, what if the Indian were? What if he died shut up there? What if Omri had killed him? At the very best, the Indian must have passed a horrible day in that dark prison. Omri was dismayed at the thought of it. Why had he allowed himself to be drawn into that silly row at breakfast instead of slipping away and making sure the Indian was all right? The mere thought that he might be dead was frightening Omri sick. He ran all the way home, burst through the back door and raced up the stairs without even saying hello to his mother. He shut the door of his bedroom and fell on his knees beside the bedside table. With a hand that shook, he turned the key in the lock and opened the cupboard door. The Indian lay there on the floor of the cupboard, stiff and stark, too stiff. That was not a dead body. Omri picked it up. It was an it, not a he, any more. The Indian was made of plastic again. Omri knelt there, appalled, too appalled to move. He had killed his Indian or done something awful to him. At the same time, he had killed his dream. All the wonderful, exciting, secret games that had filled his imagination all day. But that was not the main horror. His Indian had been real. Not a mere toy, but a person. And now, here, he lay in Omri's hand, cold, stiff, lifeless. Somehow through Omri's own fault. How had it happened? It never occurred to Omri now that he had imagined the whole incredible episode this morning. The Indian was in a completely different position from the one he had been in when Patrick gave him to Omri. Then he had been standing on one leg, as if doing a war dance, knees bent, one moccasined foot raised, both elbows bent too, with, and with one fist, with the knife in it, in the air. Now he lay flat, legs apart, arms at his sides. His eyes were closed. The knife was no longer a part of him. It lay separately on the floor of the cupboard. Omri picked it up. The easiest way to do this, he found, was to wet his finger and press it down on the tiny knife, which stuck to it. It too was plastic and could no more have pierced human skin than a twist of paper. Yet it had pierced Omri's finger this morning. The little mark was still there. But this morning it had been a real knife. Omri stroked the Indian with his finger. He felt a painful thickness in the back of his throat. The pain of sadness, disappointment and a strange sort of guilt burned inside him as if he had swallowed a very hot potato which wouldn't cool down. He let the tears come and just knelt there and cried for about ten minutes. Then he put the Indian back in the cupboard and locked the door because he couldn't bear to look at him any longer. That night at supper he couldn't eat anything and he couldn't talk. His father touched his face and said he felt very hot. His mother took him upstairs and put him to bed and oddly enough he didn't object. He didn't know if he was ill or not but he felt so bad he was quite glad to be made a fuss of. Not that that improved the basic situation but it was some comfort. What is it Omri tell me coaxed his mother. She stroked his hair and looked at him tenderly and questioningly and he never told her anything. But then he suddenly rolled over on his face. Nothing, really. She sighed, kissed him and left the room, closing the door softly after her. As soon as she had gone, he heard something. A scratching, a muttering, a definitely alive sound. Coming from the cupboard. Omri snapped his bedside light on and stared wide-eyed at his own face in the mirror on the cupboard door. He stared at the key with its twisted ribbon. He listened to the sounds now perfectly clear. Trembling, he turned the key and there was the Indian. On the shelf this time, almost exactly level with Omri's face. Alive again! Again they stared at each other. Then Omri asked falteringly, What happened to you? Happen? Good sleep happen. Cold ground. Need blanket. Food. Fire. Omri gasped. Was the little man giving him orders? Undoubtedly he was, because he waved his knife now back in his hand in an unmistakable way. Omri was so happy he could scarcely speak. Okay, you stay there, I'll get food, don't worry. 
he gasped as he scrambled out of bed. He hurried downstairs, excited but thoughtful. What could it all mean? It was puzzling, but he didn't bother worrying about it too much. His main concern was to get downstairs without his parents hearing him, get to the kitchen, find some food that would suit the Indian and bring it back without anyone asking questions. Fortunately, his parents were in the living room watching television so he was able to tiptoe to the kitchen along the dark passage. Once there, he dared not turn on a light, but there was the fridge light and that was enough. He surveyed the inside of the fridge. What did Indians eat? Meat, chiefly, he supposed. Buffalo meat, rabbits, the sort of animals they could shoot on their prairies. Needless to say, that was nothing like that. Biscuits, jam, peanut butter, that kind of thing was no problem. But somehow, Omri felt sure these were not Indian foods. Suddenly, his searching eyes fell on an open tin of sweet corn. He found a paper plate in the drawer with a picnic stuff lift and took a good teaspoon of corn. Then he broke off a crusty corner of bread. Then he thought of some cheese. And what about a drink? Milk? Surely Indian braves did not drink milk. They usually drank something called fire water in films, which was presumably a hot drink. And Omri dared not heat anything. Ordinary non-fire water would have to do. Unless, what about some Coke? That was an American drink. Luckily, there was a big... There was a bit in a big bottle left over from the birthday party, so he took that. He did wish there was some cold meat, but there just wasn't. Clutching the Coke bottle by the neck in one hand and the paper plate in the other, Omri sneaked back upstairs with fast beating heart. All was just as he had left it, except that the Indian was sitting on the edge of the shelf dangling his legs and trying to sharpen his knife on the metal. He jumped up as soon as he saw Omri. Food? he asked eagerly. Yes, but I don't know if it's what you like. I like. Give. Quick. But Omri wanted to arrange things a little. He took a pair of scissors and cut a small circle out of the paper plate. On this he put a crumb of bread, another of cheese, and one kernel of the sweet corn. He handed this offer to the Indian who backed off, looking at the food with hungry eyes but trying to keep watch on Omri at the same time. Not touch, you touch, use knife, he warned. All right, I promise not to, now you can eat. Very cautiously, the Indian sat down, this time cross-legged on the shelf. At first, he tried to eat with his left hand, keeping the knife at the ready in his right. But he was so hungry, he soon abandoned this effort laid the knife close at his side and grabbing the bread in one hand and the little crumb of cheese on the other, he began to tear at them ravenously. When these two apparently familiar foods had taken the edge off his appetite, he turned his attention to the single kernel of corn. What? he asked suspiciously. Corn, like you have, Omri hesitated. Where you come from, he said. It was a shot in the dark. He didn't know if the Indian came from anywhere, but he meant to find out. The Indian grunted, turning the corn about in both hands, for it was half as big as his head. He smelt it. A great grin spread over his face. He nibbled it. The grin grew wider, but then he held it away and looked again, and the grin vanished. Too big, he said, like you, he added accusingly. Eat it, it's the same stuff. The Indian took a bite. He still looked very suspicious, but he ate and ate. He couldn't finish it, but he evidently liked it. Give meat, he said finally. I'm sorry, I can't find any tonight, but I'll get you some tomorrow, said Omri. After another grunt, the Indian said, drink. Omri had been waiting for this. From the box where he kept his action man things, he had brought a plastic mug. It was much too big for the Indian, but it was the best he could do. Into it, with extreme care, he now poured a minute amount of coke from the huge bottle. He handed it to the Indian, who had to hold it with both hands and still almost dropped it. What? he barked after smelling it. Coca-Cola, said Omri, enthusiastically pouring some for himself into a tooth mug. Fire water? No, it's cold, but you'll like it. The Indian sipped, swallowed, gulped gulped again, grinned. Good? asked Omri. Good, said the Indian. Cheers, said Omri, 
raising his tooth mug as he'd seen his parents do when they were having a drink together. What cheers? I don't know, said Omri, feeling excessively happy, and drank. His Indian, eating and drinking. He was real, a real flesh and blood person. It was too marvellous. Omri felt he might die of delight. Do you feel better now? he asked. I better. You not better, said the Indian. You still big. You stop eat. Get right size. Omri laughed aloud and then stopped himself hastily. It's time to sleep, he said. Not now. Big light. Sleep when light go. I can make the light go, said Omri, and switched out his bedside lamp. In the darkness came a thin cry of astonishment. Omri switched it on again. The Indian was now gazing at him with something more than respect, a sort of awe. You spirit? he asked in a whisper. No, said Omri, and this isn't the sun, it's a lamp. Don't you have lamps? The Indian peered where he was pointing. That lamp? he asked unbelievingly. Much big lamp, need much oil. But this isn't an oil lamp, it works by electricity. Magic? No, electricity. But speaking of magic, how did you get here? The Indian looked at him steadily out of his black eyes. You not know? No, I don't. You were a toy. Then I put you in the cupboard and locked the door. When I opened it, you were real. Then I locked it again and you went back to being plastic. Then he stopped sharply. Wait, what if, he thought furiously, it was possible. In which case, listen, he said excitedly, I want you to come out of there. I'll find you a much more comfortable place. You said you were cold. I'll make you a proper teepee. Teepee? The Indian shouted. I not live teepee. I live longhouse. Omri was so eager to test his theory about the cupboard that he was impatient. You have to make do with a teepee tonight, he said. Hastily, he opened a drawer and took out a biscuit tin full of little plastic people. Somewhere in here was a plastic teepee. Ah, here! He pounced on it, a small pinkish cone-shaped object with designs rather badly painted on its plastic sides. Will this do? He put it on the shelf beside the Indian, who looked at it with the utmost scorn. This teepee, he said. He touched its plastic sides and made a face. He pushed it with both hands. It slid along the shelf. He bent and peered in through the triangular opening. Then he actually spat on the ground, or rather on the shelf. Oh, said Omri, rather crestfallen. You mean it's not good enough? Not want toy, said the Indian, and turned his back, folding both arms across his chest with an air of finality. Omri saw his chance. With one quick movement, he had picked up the Indian by the waist between his thumb and forefinger. In doing this, he pinned the knife, which was in the Indian's belt, firmly to his side. The dangling Indian twisted, writhed, kicked, made a number of ferocious and hideous faces, but beyond that... He was helpless, and he evidently knew it, for after a few moments he decided it was more dignified to stop struggling. Instead, he folded his tiny arms across his chest once again, put his head back, and stared with proud defiance at Omri's face, which was now level with his own. For Omri, the feeling of holding this little creature in his fingers was very strange and wonderful. If he had had any doubts that the Indian was truly alive, the sensation he had now would have put them to rest. His body was heavier now, warm and firm and full of life. Through Omri's thumb on the Indian's left side, he could feel his heart beating wildly like a bird's. Although the Indian felt strong, Omri could sense how fragile he was. Now easily an extra squeeze could injure him. He would have liked to feel him all over. His tiny arms and legs, his hair, his ears, almost too small to see. Yet when he saw how the Indian, who was altogether in his power faced him boldly and hid his fear. He lost all desire to handle him. He felt it was cruel and insulting to the Indian, who was no longer his plaything, but a person who had to be respected. Omri put him down gently on the chest of drawers where the cupboard stood. Then he crouched down till his face was again level with the Indian's. Sorry I did that, he said. The Indian, breathing heavily, and with his arms still folded, said nothing, but stared haughtily at him, as if nothing he did could affect him in any way. What's your name? asked Omri. Little Bull, said the Indian, 
pointing proudly to himself. Iroquois brave, son of chief. You, son of chief? He shot at Omri fiercely. No, said Omri humbly. Hmm, snorted little bull with a superior look. Name? Omri told him. Now, we must find you another place to sleep, outside the cupboard. Surely you sleep in teepees sometimes. Never, said little bull firmly. I've never heard of an Indian who didn't, said Omri with equal firmness. You'll have to tonight anyway. Not this, said the Indian. This no good, and fire. I want fire. I can't light a real fire in here, but I'll make sure, but I'll make you a teepee. It won't be very good, but I promise you a better one tomorrow. He looked round. It was good, he thought, that he never put anything away. Now everything he needed was strewn on the floor and on tables and shelves, ready to hand. Starting with some pick-up sticks and a bit of string, he made a sort of cone shape, tied at the top. Around this he draped, first a handkerchief, and then, when that didn't seem firm enough, a bit of old felt from a hat that had been in the dressing-up crate. It was fawn-coloured, fortunately, and looked rather like animal hide. In fact, when it was pinned together at the back with a couple of safety pins and a slit cut for an entrance, the whole thing looked pretty good, especially with the pole sticking up through the hole in the top. Omri stood, up, stood it up carefully on the chest of drawers and anxiously awaited Little Bull's verdict. The Indian walked around it four times slowly, went down on hands and knees and crawled in through the flap, came out again after a minute, tugged at the felt, stood back to look at the pulse, and finally gave a fairly satisfied grunt. However, he wasn't going to pass it without any criticism at all. No pictures, he growled. If teepee, then need pictures. I don't know how to do them, said Omri. I know, you give colours, I make. Tomorrow, said Omri, who despite himself was beginning to feel very sleepy. Blanket? Omri fished out one of the action men sleeping rolls. No good, no keep out wind. Omri started to object that there was no wind in his bedroom, but then he decided it was easier to cut up a square out of one of his old sweaters, so he did that. It was a red one with a stripe around the bottom, and even little ball couldn't hide his approval as he held it up, then wrapped it around himself. Good, warm, I sleep now. He dropped on his knees and crawled into the tent. After a moment, he stuck his head out. Tomorrow, talk. You give little bull meat, fire, paint, much things. He scowled fiercely up at Omri. Good? Good, said Omri. And indeed, nothing in his life had ever seemed so full of promise. 